Okay, so hello everyone. Today we're going to still keep talking about uh, the problem of LTL model checking. So in the previous session, we saw how we can do LTL model checking in linear time with respect to the size of the Kripke structure and in uh, exponential time with respect to the length of the formula. Uh, if you remember, we started with triply exponential time, then we made it doubly exponential, then we made it exponential. And then at some point I said, we can't really make it any better than that. Uh, so the last session was all about positive results. This session is all about negative results and showing the hardness of this problem and why we can't do any better at least until now. Uh, so what I'm going to do in this session is that I'm first going to uh, give you a refresher on the concepts of Turing machines and different classes of complexity. And then I'm going to go through several reductions. And by the end of this session, hopefully I would convince you that model checking linear temporal logic is a P-space hard problem. So the problem is actually P space complete, but I'm going to mostly focus on the hardness aspect right now. Okay. So let's start by first defining our problem. So let's call our problem LTLMC, which stands for LTL model checking. Our input is a Kripke structure K and also an LTL formula phi. And the question that we want to answer is, uh, does K satisfy phi or does K model phi? And in the previous session, we said that this basically means that is it the case that for all traces tall of k, tall satisfies phi. Okay. So what we are asking is that, is that uh, tell me yes if all the traces satisfy the, the LTL formula and tell me no if even one of the traces does not satisfy the LTL formula. Okay. So this is the main problem that we're going to look into right now. Uh, but before doing that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some complexity classes, hardness and Turing machines, and then we will come back to this. Okay. So I'm pretty sure you have all seen Turing machines in your undergraduate courses, but just to make sure that we use the same notation, let's define them. So Turing machines. So the Turing machine is basically a topple M and I would write it like this. It consists of Q, Sigma, B, H, zero, Q, A, Q, R. So Q is the set of states in our Turing machine and it's a finite set. Sigma is the input alphabet that we can have in our Turing machine. Uh, B is just another letter that is not in Sigma and it's the blank letter, which we use for, we basically use it like a space in the Turing machine. Uh, delta is the transition function. So what is the form of Delta? Delta takes a state Q and also a letter, which can either be in sigma or be the blank letter and tells us what. So how did the transitions in the Turing machine work? Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can move to the left, move to the right, or stay where you are. You can also update the letter in the place that you are right now before going left or right. And you can also change uh, 
the internal state, right? Okay, so what do we get? We get another state. We also get a letter, which is the letter that we will write at this position on the tape. And we will also get uh, a number. So, or maybe just I can write it with left, right, or stay, something like that. Or I can do it with minus one, one, or zero. Basically, how you move on the tape. Okay. Q0 is our initial state. And at the beginning, the head of the Turing machine is on, on the first letter of the input. So let's say on letter zero. QA is our accepting state and QR is our rejecting state. So we start running the Turing machine until we reach either QA or QR. If we reach QA, then the input has been accepted by the Turing machine. And if we reach QR, then the input has been rejected. Okay, so is this clear for everyone? If you haven't seen Turing machines before, I can give you some examples of them. Okay, since it's clear for everyone. So, now pretty much in the same way that we defined languages for automata, we can of course define languages for Turing machines. So the language of a Turing machine M is basically the set of all input strings that are accepted by M. And at this point, we are talking about finite inputs, right? So L of M is the set of all inputs that are accepted uh, by M. And what we mean by accepted by M is that the unique run on that input reaches QA after finitely many steps. Okay. So the other possibilities is that the run might reach QR and reject, or it might just go on forever without reaching. Uh, now, Let's go on and uh, define non-deterministic Turing machines. So what happens in a non-deterministic Turing machine? So everything is just like the previous case. So we have a set of states, an alphabet, a blank, a transition function, a starting state, an accepting state, and a rejecting state. But the only difference is, it, is in this sigma, right? So when we say that it's non-deterministic, what we mean is that instead of just giving us one choice for the successors, it can give us several choices. This is, again, just like non-deterministic bottom. So it takes a state and it takes a letter so just to write this shorter, I will define gamma to be sigma union with B so that I don't have to repeat this all the time. So it takes the state and a letter and then gives us a bunch of choices. And each choice is a state, a letter, and also a movement, left, right, or stable. So this is a non-deterministic Turing machine. Uh, I'm sure all of you have seen deterministic Turing machines before. I'm not sure if you've seen non-deterministic Turing machines, but if you haven't, it's not really that different from non-deterministic automata. Okay, so uh, now that we have this, we should also be able to define the language of a non-deterministic Turing machine, right? And again, this is exactly like the case of non-deterministic automata. So given some input string, we can have many different runs because we have some choices as to how we make this transition. 
and then an input string is accepted by the non-deterministic Turing machine if and only if there is at least one run that gets to QA. Okay. So uh, the language of M would be all inputs for which there exists at least one run that accepts. So at least one run reaches QA. Oh, and by the way, we also have this assumption that uh, our transition function delta is such that when you get to QA, you will never leave it. Or when you get to QR, you will never leave it. Okay. So, uh, yeah, basically, the you, you can look at it in two different ways. You can say that the Turing machine gets stuck and the run is finite at that point, or you can say that it just uh, remains in the same place forever. So you can define the delta such that when you are at QA, it just remains at QA, doesn't change the letters and doesn't move the head. So we also have these languages, but uh, usually what we are more interested in is the type of Turing machine that actually terminates. So in the remainder of this session, we're going to assume that every run of our Turing machines either reaches QA or reaches QR. So I, I don't want to talk about the corner case where the Turing machine doesn't terminate because that's not interesting to us. So all of our Turing machines always terminate. Okay. So based on this, uh, each Turing machine actually defines a language. And so we want to study sets of languages, just like before. The only difference is that our languages are sets of finite strings now. So, uh, I can define a complexity class. And a complexity class is basically any set of languages. Okay. So uh, a language is any set of finite uh, strings, and a complexity class is any set of languages. Uh, let me be very clear about that. So we have an alphabet sigma. Then we have the set of uh, finite strings or finite sequences over sigma. A language L is just a subset of this. And a complexity class is a set of languages. So it's a subset of two to the power of six. Okay. Uh, so some of the major complexity classes that I'm sure you've already heard about are P, N, P, and the one that we are going to mostly work with today is P space. So what is P? P is the set of all languages that have a Turing machine that runs in polynomial time and decides that language. So P is the set of all languages L, sequence star, such that there exists some Turing machine M, such that the language of M is L, and also M runs in polynomial time. So I, I don't have notation for that right now, so I'm just going to uh, say that the runtime of M is bounded by some polynomial. Okay. When the input size is M. 
this is a point. There are some things that we have to be very careful when we're very careful about when we're defining P. And one of them is that this M here should actually be deterministic. Okay, so this is a deterministic Turing machine. And what happens if we use a non-deterministic Turing machine? Then we get NP. So NP is the same thing except that we have a non-deterministic Turing machine. So NP is the set of all languages for which there exists an M, and this M is now non-deterministic, such that uh, it decides this language, and also the runtime and input of size M is bounded by some polymer. Actually, I should probably say that there exists M and also. So the intuition here is that when we are talking about P, P is the set of all problems or all languages that you can solve using a normal program, not normal deterministic program that runs in polynomial time. But NP is the set of all languages uh, that you can, or all problems that you can solve using a non-deterministic program that runs in polynomial time. So when we're talking about a non-deterministic program, it can make non-deterministic choices. And because it accepts something, if one of the choices leads to acceptance, it's pretty much intuitively thought of as guessing. So if you have a program that can magically guess how to branch when it gets to non-determinism, and then this magic program can solve your problem in polynomial time, then your problem is in it. Okay. So. Uh, I'm going to now just define reductions very fast because the, the final thing that I need to get to is hardness. And then I want to be able to show that our problem of LTL model checking is P space hard. Okay. So uh, what's the reduction? So let's say that I have two languages, L1 and L2. And these are both languages. So a reduction is basically a function F that uh, maps strings to strings. And basically the the property that we want to have for it is that our initial string is in L1, if and only if our final string is in L2. So if you take some string W, W is in L1, or all W sigma star, W is in L1, if and only if F of W is in L2. And we also want F to be computable uh, in polynomial time. Okay. So a reduction is basically some function that maps inputs of the first problem to inputs of the second problem without changing the answer. So uh, an instance is a no instance here, if and only if after applying this function, it's a no instance there, and it's a yes instance here, if and only if it's a yes instance on the other side. And we also want our reduction to be computable in polynomial time. So what's the point of having the function like this? Well, basically the point is that if you have a polynomial time algorithm for L2, then using this function, you will also get a polynomial time algorithm for L1, right? Because 
the algorithm for L1 is first apply F and then you have an instance of L2 and solve it using the algorithm for L2. So what this basically tells us is that which one of these problems is harder? L2 is harder, right? Because if you can solve L2, then you have a way of also solving L1. So I write it like this. And basically, whenever I write something like this, I mean that I have a reduction from L1 to L2, or in other words, that L2 is harder than L1. Okay. So now we know kind of how to uh, compare different languages in terms of hardness. And actually, uh, it's easy to see that there are many cases where L1 is. Um, well, L1 is harder than L2 and L2 is harder than L1 as well. So you can have reductions on both sides. And uh, this is not a total order. Now, based on this, we can actually define hardness and completeness. So let's see the complexity class. So a complexity class is a set of languages. Uh, oh, actually, is this correct? So, this is the set of strings. To, to, um, yeah, okay. So, let's see the complexity class. Uh, how can we define hardness with respect to C? So, I say that a language L is C hard if L is harder than every language in C. So if and only if for any language L prime that is in C, L is harder than L prime. So note that this means that I will need a reduction from L prime to L. Okay. Um, So uh, I can also define completeness right here. So L is C complete. If and only if L is C hard and also L itself is in C. Right, so when I say a language is C complete or a problem is C complete. What I mean is that it's in C itself and it's also harder than every other problem in C. Okay. So there is this diagram that I'm pretty sure you have all seen before. So let's say this is NP. And a tiny part in this NP is going to be P. So let's put it maybe here. This is P. Okay. And then we also have a bunch of problems that are NP complete or NP hard. So if you take all the problems that are NP hard, so let's say these are all the problems that are NP hard. Then these ones here would be the problems that are NP complete because they're in NP and they're also NP hard. But now I'm going to introduce some new complexity classes. Uh, okay. So the first complexity class that I'm going to define is what I call co NP. So co NP is the set of all languages whose complement is in NP. So this is every language L such that L complement is in NP. And actually co here stands for complement. But I'm not defining co P. Why, why don't I define co P? Yes, because P is close under complementation. 
So this whole uh, thing with co works only if you have non-determinism. If you don't have non-determinism, then uh, you have an algorithm that is deciding that problem or that language in polynomial time. And then you can just run this algorithm and at the end change the answer from zero to one or from one to zero. So, and, and get an algorithm for the complement language. So this whole system, this defining of co-complexity classes really makes sense only when uh, you have some non-determinism. Okay. So if we want to add co-MP to this picture, it would be well, it gets a bit messy, but let's well, it will contain all of P. It's something like this. This is O and P. Okay. So we know that P is in the intersection of NP and co and P, but of course you all know that it's a big open problem whether P is equal to NP. Okay. Now, because we had hardness and stuff like that, we can definitely also define co and p hardness. So, uh, generally, don't take this uh, picture as possible because a lot of these things are open problems, whether they are equal to each other or not. So, I'm just trying to give some intuition here. So, we have a bunch of problems that are co and p hard and a bunch of problems that are co and p complete. So, I can have something like this. This is co and p hard, and then this part here is co and p complete. And it is actually well known that the language is co and p hard if and only if its complement is np hard. And it's not too hard to prove it either. So I'm just going to leave this here. So L is co and p hard. If and only if L complement is NP hard. Okay. So these are the classes that are usually seen in all sorts of verification problems. But what we are more interested for today is actually yet another complexity class, and that's P space. So all of the complexity classes that we've seen until this point really talk about the runtime of the Turing machine. The point about P space is that it's defined in terms of the amount of space that the Turing machine uses. So how many uh, different positions on the tape are actually written to, or how many different positions on the tape are accessed. Or if you think about the Turing machine as a program, like a C++ program, how much memory do you use? Okay, so P space is basically the set of all problems that are solvable with a polynomial amount of space. Or the set of all languages that have a Turing machine that decides them using only polynomially many uh, accesses to polynomially many uh, different uh, boxes in the tape. Let's call it here. So P space is the set of decision problems or languages uh, solvable in polynomial space. Actually, sometimes people don't even use P, they just say P time instead of P, and then they say P space just to be clearer. But uh, so what's actually nice about P space is that P space uh, is equal to NP space. So I have to go back to the definition. So P space is decision problems that are solvable in polynomial space using a deterministic Turing machine. Right, and NP space would be the set of problems that are solvable in polynomial space using a non-deterministic Turing machine. 
but it is actually well known that P space is equal to NP space. And this is a theorem due to Savage. So that's great. But also, well, because of the same type of argument that we had that we said P and co P are the same, so we don't really define co P. The same thing appears here as well, right? If you look at P space, you are really talking about problems that are solvable using deterministic Turing machines, right? So P space would be equal to co P space. They're the same. Why? Because if I have an algorithm for a problem that solves it using a polynomial amount of memory, then I can use the same algorithm for the complement of this problem. Just solve the original problem and change your answer at the end. And it also uses polynomial memory, right? So we have this nice case here where uh, we have a complexity class and adding non-determinism doesn't change it. And also the complexity class is equal to this code class. And of course, we also have P space hardness. We have P space completeness, just like uh, with P and NP and so on. Okay. So the main theorem that we want to see today, well, Actually, I'm going to give you two different theorems. So I'm going to talk about this problem of LTL model checking. And first, I'm going to show you that LTL model checking is co-NP hard. Okay. And secondly, I'm going to show you that LTL model checking is P space hard. It's actually P space complete, but we really care about its hardness right now. Uh, so what does this mean? If we look at this picture, so P space would be something that takes over NP and co NP. I'm not going to draw it. It makes things really hard, but let's say this is P space. So, Basically, our problem is kind of even harder than the NP complete problems. So there is no chance of finding any polynomial time algorithm. Or if you do, you will win a million dollars. And it's actually even much harder than that. So when, when a problem is P space hard, people usually don't have uh, any hope of finding any sub exponential algorithm for it. So it kind of shows that the exponential algorithm that we have is already pretty much optimal. Uh, well, it's not optimal in terms of uh, the exact runtime. So maybe you can find an algorithm that takes uh, a runtime of 1.7 to the power of the length of the formula instead of two to the power of the length of the formula. But you can't do better than exponential probably. Okay, so let's now go ahead and see these two theorems. First, that the LTL model checking is co NP hard. And secondly, that the LTL model checking is P space hard. So the first one is going to be quite easy. The second one might take a long time. Okay. So. Uh, let me actually my initial paper. So this was our LTL model checking problem. Uh, what do we want to do? We want to prove that LTL model checking is co NP hard. What does this mean? This means that the complement language is NP hard. So I want to say that the complement of LTL model checking. is empty heart. Hmm? Okay, what is the complement of LTL model checking? So the input is the same, 
right? We have a Kripke structure K and an LTL formula V. But the question is basically reversed. So the question is, is it the case that K does not satisfy V? And what does this mean? So this means that does there exist some trace T such that T does not satisfy V? Okay. Uh, so, we want to show that this problem is MP hard. What should we do? We can take another MP hard problem and reduce it to this one. So the problem that I'm going to take is the one that people usually take for this example, and it's uh, the problem of Hamiltonian paths. So in Hamiltonian paths, the input is a graph, a finite graph G. Uh, and let's say that it's directed. And the question is, is there a path that visits each one of the vertices exactly once? So is there a path? visits each vertex exactly once. Okay. So we should now reduce Hamiltonian path to the complement of LTL model technique to this problem. How can we find such a reduction? Basically, we have the input of this problem. We have a graph. And we want to find some Kripke structure and some formula such that the Kripke structure does not satisfy that formula if and only if the graph here has a Hamiltonian path. OK, so let's say that I have some graph. Let's just create a graph with Hamiltonian path. Uh, okay, here's the Hamiltonian path first, and then I just add some on the edges as well. Okay, so this is my graph G. What I say is let's take the same graph as our Kripke structure. So let's say that I have some vertex numbers as well. So this is one, two, three, four. And I let and I let my Kripke structure K be the same graph. Well I also have to define the initial vertices in a Kripke structure because the Kripke structure wasn't just a graph of course. Uh, so I let every vertex be an initial vertex. So this is an initial vertex, this is an initial vertex. And the idea is that uh, I basically want to find the path, uh, I, I want to find the trace T in my Kripke structure that gives me a Hamiltonian path here in the original graph, right? So in order to do that, I look at the graph and say, okay, a Hamiltonian path can start anywhere in the graph. So intuitively it makes sense to say that in the Kripke structure, every vertex is an initial vertex. Okay, and also I just let the set of uh, atomic propositions be equal to the set of vertices. And so at vertex one, atomic proposition one holds, at vertex two, atomic proposition two holds and so on. Okay, now I need to write a formula that models basically a Hamiltonian path for the lack of a Hamiltonian path. So let's try to write that. So what would my formula phi be? 
So what do I want to do? I want to visit each one of the vertices exactly once. Right? How can I write that as a as an NTL formula? Well, first of all, I want to definitely visit all of the vertices, right? So I can say that I can have an and over all of my vertices and I will visit that vertex. So eventually I will see V and this should hold for every V. Right? But what else should hold? Well, if I saw V, then I shouldn't see it again. So how can I write this as an MTL formula? No. So this is how, so I say that it should always be the case that if I see V right now, then I will never see V again. Okay, does this make sense? So it, it, it's saying that at every point in time, if I'm seeing V right now, then from the next step onwards, I will never see V. Okay, but there is still a problem, right? Because, well, if you have an infinite path on this graph, then we're going to see some vertices infinitely many times. So that's not such a great thing. Uh, and in order to get rid of that, I'm going to just introduce one new vertex. Let's call it sync and put edges from every vertex to the sync. And also it's a sink, so you can never get it. So basically the idea is that you can go through some uh, finite paths in the original graph. And then at some point you have to decide to go to the sink because otherwise you will see some vertex more than once and that's not allowed by the formula. Okay, so let's see what we have. So if our Kripke structure satisfies this formula, then what? No. So the definition of a Kripke structure satisfying a formula was that every trace of the Kripke structure should satisfy that formula. So if our Kripke structure satisfies this formula, it basically means that every path is a Hamiltonian path. So that's not what we wanted. What did we want? We want to have a formula such that if there is even one trace that satisfies it, then we're done. So actually what we can do here is that we can just take the negation of this whole formula. So, so, that. so I'll take the negation of this whole thing. And now what happens? Now the thing that happens is that if the Kripke structure satisfies this formula, then none of the paths in my Kripke structure are uh, Hamiltonian paths, right? So my original graph has a Hamiltonian path, if and only if my Kripke structure does not satisfy this formula. Right? So this gives us a reduction from the problem of Hamiltonian path to the complement of LTL model checking. So the complement of LTL model checking is MP hard and LTL model checking itself is co MP hard. Okay. Any questions about this reduction? Yes. Right. So if if it doesn't satisfy this new formula P that is now complemented, 
then there is at least one Hamiltonian pass. Yeah. Because this whole thing just says that our pass was Hamiltonian. Okay, so now we at least know that LTL model checking is co MP hard. Now let's go on and see if we can prove something better, if we can prove that it is actually P space hard. So this is probably going to take more time than we have right now. You can leave at the end of the normal time of the session. You don't have to stay for this. And it wouldn't be in the exam or anything. So, uh, okay. So before doing that, let's actually look into this problem, the complement of LTL model checking. So the complement of LTL model checking is very much similar to the original LTL model checking. But the only difference is that here we had a universal uh, quantifier and here we have uh, an existential quantifier. So here we were saying that for all traces, they should satisfy phi. Here we are saying that there should exist a trace that does not satisfy phi. But saying that this trace does not satisfy phi is equivalent to saying that this trace satisfies negation of phi. Right? So if I just switch negation of phi in, and put it in place of phi here, then basically the only difference between LTL model checking and its complement is that LTL model checking talks about a universal property that all traces should satisfy some formula. And its complement talks about an existential property that there should be one trace that satisfies some formula. And that's actually the problem that we're going to use for showing P space hardness. So let's, let's call this existential LTL model checking. And this is the formula, this is the problem where the input is uh, a Kripke structure K and, a, and an LTL formula L. And the question is, uh, does there exist some trace of the Kripke structure that satisfies P? Okay. So we just wrote that this is equivalent to the complement of LTL model checking. Now, what do we want to do with this existential LTN model checking? So what, what I ultimately want to prove is that the original problem of LTL model checking uh, is P space hard. Right? So instead of that, I can just show that the existential version is copy space hard, but copy space is just P space. So it's enough to just show that the existential LTL model checking is P space hard. Now why? Again, this is actually P space complete, but showing that it's in P space is much easier. So I'm just going to do the hard part and show that it's P space hard. What should I do to show that the problem is P space hard? It's just like proving the MP hardness. You have to either find another P space hard problem and reduce it to your problem or you have to do what we're going to do right now and just show that any P space problem can be reduced to this problem. Okay, so let's do that. Let's say that I have some problem or some language L, which is in P space. What does this mean? Well, we said that, uh, L being in P space means that there is a deterministic Turing machine M uh, that decides L in polynomial space. 
So basically the language of this Turing machine is that. Now, I'm going to give a reduction uh, from this basically to LTL model checking. So what do I have in my reduction? So in my reduction, on the one hand, I have some M and let's say that it decides L in polynomial space, which is bounded by some polynomial P. So this is a deterministic Turing machine. This is the runtime or some bound on the runtime. And also I will have some input to this Turing machine, right? So I will have some, uh, let's call it W, which is the input. So what I'm doing right now is that I'm saying, instead of reducing just one problem to LTL model checking, I'm going to take any problem that is solvable in P space and then reduce its inputs to uh, inputs for LTL model checking. Okay. So in my reduction, I'm going to get these things and then what is my function f going to give me on the other side? It's going to give me a Kripke structure k and also uh, an LTL formula phi. And we said that we we're talking about existential LTL model checking. So the property that we want is that w is in the language of m if and only if there exists some trace of K that satisfies P. Okay, so this is the setup. I have a deterministic Turing machine M. It's, uh, well, I'm sorry, this is not the runtime. It's the uh, space usage or space complexity. So it, it uses at most P of N, let's say if N is the size of the input, it uses at most P of N units of space. And I also have some input to this. And I want to turn this whole thing into a Kripke structure and, a, and an LTL formula such that this input is accepted by this deterministic Turing machine. If and only if there is some trace of this Kripke structure that satisfies this formula. Uh, so the construction itself is actually quite important. So here's the construction that we're going to have. We start with putting a bunch of vertices uh, in our previous structure. So let's say I have a vertex zero, vertex one, and so on. So two until vertex P n. So, oh, sorry. Okay. So I'm going to put a bunch of vertices and the number of vertices is equal to the space usage or the upper bound on the space usage that I had. So my, I already have n, why? Because I have the input W and because I have the input W, N is just its length. And I know the function P, so I can compute P of N. And I can, and I know that P is polynomial, of course. So these are polynomially many vertices. In my Kripke structure, okay. And then I'm going to put a row of vertices in between each pair. So, a bunch of vertices here. I will talk about this later. A bunch of vertices here and a bunch of vertices here. And I'm going to connect zero to all of these. Connect all of these to one. And then just 
continuum like that. So one goes to all of the intermediaries there, these go to all of the intermediaries. And this is also the case. And finally, I will have an edge from my very last vertex back to my vertex zero. Okay. So this is my Kripke structure. Now let me talk about what these in these uh, black vertices are. So uh, first of all, let me tell you how many of them we're going to have. Uh, so I'm going to have uh, vertices here that are of this form, of the form Q uh, A1. Q is a state in my Turing machine. So Q is in Q. Uh, A is a letter. So A is in gamma. So it's either one of my input letters or it's just uh, the blank letter. And one is the name of the successor. And here I will have vertices that are of the form Q, A, 2, and so on. And here I will have Q, A, P of N. Okay. But I'm going to just say that the Q, instead of just being a, a state in my Turing machine, can also be a very special object, which I call a star. So Q is either a star or a state in my Turing machine. A is a letter. And then the third one is just the name of the successor. So it's one here, it's two here and so on. So how many vertices do I have between zero and one? So the number of vertices is the number of states of the Turing machine plus one times number of letters in the alphabet plus one. And that's it. So it's polynomial. That's what I'm trying to say. The number of vertices that I put here are coming. Okay. So what is the intuition? Why am I doing this? So think of our Turing machine. And let's say that we take one of its configurations. And by configuration, I mean one of the possible situations that the Turing machine can be in when it's running, right? So, First of all, there should be, there is a cursor in the Turing machine and the cursor should be somewhere between index one and index PN, right? So the way I want to look at this is that I want to look at a path that starts from zero and goes all the way to PN and consider that path as some configuration or some situation in my Turing machine. And the way I do this is as follows. So I start here. I first go to one of these initial vertices here. If in the initial vertex, if in the uh, intermediary vertex, sorry, I have a star, then the star tells me that the cursor is not here. So the cursor is not at index one. But if I have one of the states of my Turing machine, then it tells me that the cursor is there and I'm in that particular state of the Turing machine. Okay. So I'm really interested in the paths that go from zero to PN and they have stars everywhere and have only one Turing machine state somewhere just once in the whole path. Okay. And also uh, I can read the, uh, I can also model the contents of my Turing machine's tape, right? So if I have a path that goes from here to here, I can look at the first intermediary vertex, read its letter and say that this is the letter that is at position one on my tape. Then I look at the second intermediary vertex in my path I read its letter and say, this is the letter that is in my second uh, box on my tape and so on. Okay. So 
a single path from zero to Pn can model one configuration of our Turing machine. Now, well, but that's not really what we want to model, right? What we want to model is a run of the Turing machine. And that's actually modeled by this edge, which goes back. So this edge corresponds to one step of the execution of the Turing machine. So you have a path here, which goes from zero to PN and gives you the first configuration of the Turing machine. Then you take this edge and go back and go through another path that gives you the second configuration of your Turing machine at the second point in time. And then this continues. Okay. So what do I want to do? I want to write some formula phi such that uh, there is a path here that satisfies that formula phi if and only if my Turing machine accepts my input word. Right. So there are several problems here. The first problem is that we made this whole thing only based on the Turing machine. So we are not using the word at all, the input word at all. The second problem is that we have a lot of completely meaningless paths here. So for example, I can have a path where I see star everywhere, which basically means that my character is nowhere, or I can have paths that have more than one non-star intermediary vertex in there, which means that I have more than one cursor. I can have paths that do not satisfy the conditions of the transition in my Turing machine. I can also have paths that just cannot happen using that particular input port that we have. So all of these things should be captured by our LTL formula. We have to write an LTL formula that gets rid of all these bad cases. And so I want to write an LTL formula such that a path in this Kripke structure satisfies that LTL formula if and only if this is a valid path, it gives me a valid execution of my Turing machine on this particular input. And also it accepts the input because the whole idea was that we want to have a path that satisfies the formula if and only if the input is accepted by the Turing machine. Okay, so I'm going to write my formula phi and it's going to consist of several parts. So uh, I'm going to call them phi start, uh, phi conf, uh, phi delta and phi n. What do I want to do in each part? So in phi start, I want to write an LTL formula that says that uh, my path starts from the right configuration, from the initial configuration of the Turing machine. In phi conf, what I want to write is that all of the configurations that I see in my path are correct configurations. So I don't have these cases where I have my cursor nowhere or at more than one place. In phi delta, I want to say that I respect the transition function of the original uh, of the original deterministic Turing machine. And in phi a, I want to say that I reach an accepting state. Okay, so let's go through this and try to write these one by one. Okay, so let's start with phi start. So I want to write some LTL formula that tells me that I, I start at the right configuration at the beginning. So what is the initial configuration in the run of my deterministic Turing machine? It's a configuration in which the Turing machine is at state Q0, the cursor is pointing at uh, the first place in memory, the first place on the tape. And also the tape contents are 
basically our uh, word W. Okay. So let's write all of this. So phi of phi star is what? The first thing, uh, let's start with saying that we have W everywhere. So for all I from zero to N minus one, eventually I W I. Right. So what this says is that uh, at state uh, at the ice vertex in my path, I will see W I. But that's not quite correct, right? Because, well, these are the uh, so every uh, every point in my tape is actually captured by a sequence of two vertices here in these paths, right? So I have to make this two i minus one actually, I guess something like that. So basically, in step 2i minus 1, I'm at one of these intermediary vertices. And when I'm at that intermediary vertex, I want to see the letter wi there. So these intermediary vertices, remember, they have a letter. They have a state of the original, uh, autom uh, of the original Turing machine. And they also have uh, the place of the tape right now, OK? so. This is what I want, but I also want the rest of my tape to be empty. So I want for every i from n to, let's say, p of n, uh, maybe p of n divided by two or something like that. No, uh, no. So uh, no, that's fine. Uh, so I want this basically. Uh, I want to have the blank there. Right. So from from index zero to n minus one, I want to have my input, and from index n to p n, I want to have blanks. So this is the first part. This basically says that the tape is correct. So what else do I need? I also need to say that my cursor is at the very first of the inputs, right? So my cursor should be here. How can I say that my cursor is here? So, okay, and by the way, I forgot to say this zero is of course the only initial vertex here. So the way that I can say my cursor is here is to just say that in the next state, I see my cursor. So in the next state, I don't see a star because a star was the absence of the cursor. So this is just and next not star. Okay. What else did I need? I needed to be at state Q zero of my Turing machine. So I should also have and Next Q zero. Okay, this was phi start. So what this says is that we start at the right place. Now, the next one. Uh, so we did this one. Let's do phi conf. So in phi conf, what I want to say is that I don't see any invalid configurations. So every time that I go from zero to PN, I will see the cursor only once, right? And do I have any other, uh, any other constraints there? No. No, it's basically just that, right? So I want to see the cursor only once. Okay, so how do I say that I see the cursor only once? So seeing the cursor is seeing not star. So I want to have not star only once. So this is similar to our previous reduction. I want to eventually see not star. And also I want to be sure that whenever I see not star, 
This is the last time I'm seeing that stuff. Okay. So this is what I need for my configurations. Now let's do this one. I want to be sure that I reach an accepting state. This is the simplest one, right? So I want to be sure that I reach the accepting state. So this is just saying that I eventually reach the accepting state. Right, okay, that's great, yes. So this is not okay. So we have to... Uh, Yes, but here's the thing. So the way that I defined my configurations like this is that, oh, and we have to come back to that because that's not completely done. So basically what I'm saying is that every time I go from zero to PN, I see stars everywhere and I see states of the, uh, I see a state of my original Turing machine only once. So everywhere, instead of that one, uh, everywhere other than that one place, I'm seeing star. And in that one place, I'm seeing the state that my Turing machine is in, right? So if at some point I see QA, I'm sure that I'm really seeing QA in my Turing machine as well. But okay, we have to go back. So this one is done, but we have to go back to this comp because I made an error there. So phi comp was that we basically wanted to say that all of our, uh, and that all of our uh, configurations are correct. That we have the cursor only once, basically, right? But the problem here was that uh, what we wrote here is that in the whole run, we will have the cursor only once. So this is not correct. We have to say that every time that we get to position zero, in the path from zero to, P, uh, to Pn, we will see the cursor only once. Okay, so let's do this again. So let's say phi conf. So, yeah, these things are tricky. I might make a lot of errors here, but the point is that you can finally write them in Elton. So the idea is that whenever I reach zero, uh, and by zero, I mean basically this, this exact vertex zero, the red zero. Then what happens? Then I will see at most one non-star uh, intermediary vertex until I reach P of n. How should I write that? Any ideas? Yes, exactly. So always it is the case that if I'm currently at vertex zero, then I first choose at which index in the uh, future I want to see uh, PN. So I don't know, this is like two PN minus one. So uh, at index after I steps, I want to see some Q. So I want to see not star. And then for every J after that I, from I plus one to two PN minus one, I want to see either a star or a number. So I can, uh, uh, okay, so it's becoming hard to write this because, uh, okay, so I can, write it like uh, either I have like 
i divided by inside j divided by two. Uh, that's hard to get. So basically what I want to say is that I, I want to ignore these vertices and I only want to talk about these intermediary vertices. So let's try this again. Third time. Okay. So if I'm seeing this red vertex zero now, then for every i starting from one to pn, and let's do two i minus one here. Okay, and okay. So what I'm saying here is that whenever I see this vertex zero, then I jump by two steps at each time. So I should either see not star here or not star here or not star here. So that's what I'm saying here. At one of the odd uh, places, I shouldn't see not star. And then after that, I should always uh, just see star. Right, so this is 2j minus one star. Okay, so let's go over this again. So whenever I get to this vertex zero, in one of these uh, columns, I will see not star. So when I see not star, it means the cursor is there, right? And when I see not star at column I, then at every future column, oh, this should be and. At every future column, I will see star. Okay. Actually, this is still not good enough because this doesn't say that we have one. So instead of this, I should say, every j from one to pn that is not equal to i. Yeah, so I'm seeing it only once. Finally, hopefully this works. Okay, so I will put up lecture notes for this lecture that have the final version that actually works. Okay, so we could write the configurations. We could write the acceptance. We could write the condition that we have to start from the right place. Now we have to do the hardest work of all. We have to model the transitions of our uh, deterministic Turing machine. And okay. this is V uh, of Delta. Okay, so I just look at every transition separately. Okay, so for every starting vertex, so for every Q in Q, and every letter, every letter A in gamma, I write a formula phi of QA, and then I just take the end of all of that. Okay, so. Phi of QA, how do I write this? What do I want to write here really? So I have a Delta of QA in my original Turing machine. That tells me what? It tells me that you go to some other state Q prime, that uh, you update the letter to some other letter, for example, A prime, and that you either go left, right, or stay where you are. So that, let's say it says, uh, I don't know what to call it. Let's call it, let's have minus one there for this example. And then for one and zero, it's very similar. So the formula that we write here is this. Uh, okay, so let's go back here. So what we want to say is that if the current state is Q, and the current letter that I'm reading is A. Then the next state should be Q prime. The letter should be updated to A prime. And we have to go once, we have to move the cursor one unit to the left. 
okay? So the first thing is how do we figure out if we are really at state Q on our reading letter A? This is easy. This happens only if we are at one of these intermediate vertices and we have Q and A. But let's just again enumerate over all the possible cases. So let's say that whenever I am at this state zero, then, so what do I want to write here? I want to say that if I'm at state Q and reading letter A, then in the next state, I have to go to Q prime in prime. Okay, so how do I say if I'm at state Q? I have to do an or for I from one to P of N and say I minus one Q. Right, this, this part basically says that I'm at state Q of the Turing machine. But I also want to say that at the same point when I'm at state Q, I'm also seeing letter A, so I can do this, okay? So if this thing holds, then what? Then something. So I'm going to write that something. Uh, yes. So first of all, uh, we have to basically go a whole cycle around here. Right, And we don't just have to say that this becomes Q prime. We have to also say that everything else remains the same. And that's kind of the hard part. So here what's happening is that at column I, I am seeing my state QA, right? QAI, let's call it that. And when I'm seeing this state, I basically want to say that every other column remains the same, uh, but this column changes and also the cursor moves. Okay, so first let's say that every other column remains the same. Now, note that at, we are currently at the point of time where we are in zero because after two I minus one steps, we are going to get to I, right? So how do I say that everything remains the same? That's easy. I just say that for every I from one to PN, if I go to I minus one steps, I get the same thing as if I go, uh, what if I go uh, to PN plus two I, what is the exact number? So. Uh, I go one here, but I go to PN. Uh, okay, I need two steps to get to one. I need two PN states to get to PN. And then I need plus one to get here. Uh, yeah, the numbers, uh, I think it's minus two or not. I hate calculations. So basically what I want to say is that when I go one whole round, I will get the same thing. So how long is a round? Uh, a round is 2 PN plus one, right? So actually this is 2 PN plus one plus two I minus one and the one gets canceled. So these two states should be the same. So I should say that just for every atomic proposition. So let's call our atomic proposition alpha in the set of atomic propositions. Alpha holds here if and only if alpha holds here. Okay, so I'm basically saying that I'm starting here and the state that I will see at this point is the same as the state that I will see after going one round and coming back here. And the same thing for all of them. Okay, but not exactly all of them. 
right? Yeah, <laughs> except the one that has Q in it. Uh, okay, so let's use J here instead of I. And let's say that J is not equal to I. And actually here, yeah, everything works. So this was just saying that everything else remains the same. What else do we need to say? We also need to say that this one changes to uh, basically A prime, right? Uh, so, okay, let, let's say that this is zero because minus one, then I have to take care of the case that the previous state also changes. So let, let's say that our head does not change. So I also have to say that after this index I, uh, where I saw this, when I go one round and come back, I will see the same thing, but I will see B. So basically for every uh, propositional atom, atomic proposition, except for uh, A, and A prime, we have this. And we also have, after going one round, and so going one round and coming back here is 2pn plus 2i. When we do that, then at this point, we will have Q prime and N prime, right? And if this was minus one, then I had to put a minus two here just because in the other state of practice. And I had to also take care of making the current place uh, into a star and stuff. Okay. So I hope that I could convince you that we can write this in LTL and that the size of the formula is polynomial. So in the end, putting all of this together, we got this formula and we got this uh, Kripke structure. And there is a path in this Kripke structure that satisfies this formula. If and only if there is a run in the original deterministic Turing machine that accepts our input. So basically we could reduce any uh, problem that was solvable in P space uh, to the problem of uh, existential LTL model checking. So existential LTL model checking is P space hard. And because we showed that P space is equal to co-P space. So the complement of existential LTL model checking is also P space hard and the complement of existential LTL model checking was universal LTL model checking. So LTL model checking is P space hard. Okay, and that's all for this session. Thank you so much. And tell me if you have any questions. I'm going to stop the recording.